now i may request our guest speaker dr didar a singh dr singh is a secretary general of fiki is a former civil ser civil servant who retired as secretary to government of india he has done phd in e-commerce and also <laughs> and also a, an expert in e-commerce trade and migration and has been a consultant for several international agencies okay Thanks. i'm going to speak from right here there's somebody who's been somewhere else for six months and has come back so just ask yourself i think virtually 100 percent of the people here are migrants yes. so that's that's what makes for the fact of mobility mobility is ingrained in in the human gene and then suddenly the world decided that mobility is something that's not allowed it's very nice to see this you call yourself what is your what is your title you call yourself the global research forum on diaspora and transnationalism why do you use the word transnationalism you use it because obviously you're you're mentioning or you're pointing out that nationalism has become a barrier. And you know when this happened? I think we sometimes tend to forget it's only in the 19th century that the very concept of nationalism actually came. And it's only in the 20th century that border controls came. Before that, there was free movement. And, and if you really look at it, it's post First World War. There was free movement of everybody everywhere. And then it suddenly stopped. And today it's become of such a large issue that the whole world, and particularly the developed world, is closed on its borders and is now looks at mobility really as a security issue. It's no more seen as what it originally was. It was an economic issue. And that is why the little few words that I want to share with you is that the only way to break this, it's not going to be by governments, it's not going to be by NGOs, it's not going to be by conferences, it's going to only be by business. The little limited point I have to make is that it's, you, unless you have a business case for migration, you're not going to be able to go beyond this activity or beyond, beyond the barriers that you're constantly creating. And it is for this reason that, you know, I, I work at Fiki now, I used to be earlier, as I just mentioned, we have a secretary in the government of India and a ministry which is now closed down. But, um, in Fiki, we established, and we are probably, the, I think, the first Fiki, incidentally, in case you don't know, is a Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. It's a body that started in 1927. It's a very large body with, you know, a quarter million members and it's got connectivity all over the world. We are probably the only organization in the world, a business body, which has established a migration and diaspora unit. We have a vertical on migration and diaspora. And why do we have it? Only for this reason, because mobility is an issue for business. In today's competitive world, unless you can have the free movement of human resource along with the free movement of capital and of course services and goods, you're not going to be able to be competitive. And that is a case that India particularly needs to make. Because it is us who are able to actually, well, and it's only because of so many of you here, you are the youth, you are the dividend that we keep talking about all the time. You are the dividend which is available actually in this scale and this level and this education only in India. And therefore, India will become the world's provider of professionals and workers around the world. I think, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, that by 2025, there will be 110 million Indians working all around the world. That will be more than China or any other country because we are the only one which, which, which has this demographic dividend at the moment. So it is this context that migration becomes extremely important for India and, and for, for, for business. And this is where we talk about, in, 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 when we talk about a business case for migration, we are basically talking of freer economic migration, it's good for business, it catalyzes innovation, investment, entrepreneurship, all of these things happen if you have new ideas and new people coming in and, and working with you all the time. It is for this reason, therefore, that I'm going to mention there's three, four things which are important as we look at the mobility of people. And we sometimes tend to forget this. The single most important issue is actually skills. You know, we, we presume 
that the migrants that are going, we have presumed there are only of two categories. Either they are, they are fancy professionals or IIT, as we've just mentioned, who go to the US and get great jobs and doctors and whatever that move. They're already educated. The Indian government and, and the Indian society has already put a lot of money into them. And for whatever reason, they travel. And, you know, this is this whole brain drain issue. But remember, India is the only country in the world which never raised a brain drain issue. Because we've always taken it as something which is which is part of our mobility and many people, you know, return migrants again come back to India and actually contribute to our economic development in the country itself. India again, as, as many of you may or may not be aware, India is a country that records the world's highest number of return migrants. 100,000 people come back every year and most of these 100,000 are actually professionals. So that's one category. The second category is labor. Because we have 7 million people in the Gulf and some in Malaysia and Singapore, we presume that this is an automatic movement. It is not going to remain an automatic movement. As the world begins to upscale its services and its manufacturing, you are going to have to have skills. Without skills, you are going to be a nobody. Unskilled labor will be, will be gone as we see ourselves moving up the value chain. And this is why skilling is extremely important, not just for internal mobility of persons, but for mobility overseas. If you're going to be able to retain this, and we need to retain this because we have a very large population. Everybody is not going to be able to find a fancy job in India itself. So you have to, there's going to be a pressure, there's going to be a move for it. The government of India doesn't push it. It's not part of government of India's policy. But we need to stop anybody from going or stop anybody from coming back. So this is going to be part of a process of skilling for overseas employment is something that I'd like to flag. This is something which is not talked about much. There's not much research on it, but uh, there is possibly a proposal in government of India to actually look at this and, and, and move it forward. The second thing that I want to talk about is actually diaspora engagement, and this is the second part of it. Uh, Madam was correctly mentioning, uh, Dr. Ganesh just now, that there is a distinction and a difference between what is a migrant and what is a diaspora, and who wants to be called a migrant and who wants to be called a diaspora. So this is also, it's definitional, I, I won't get into the details of it, but basically, a migrant of today becomes the diaspora of tomorrow. And therefore, they're both of them are extremely interlinked issues. And India as a country, how have we engaged with our diaspora? Now, again, uh, Professor just mentioned this, that post-independence, there was a different view where we were emerging as a, as a developing country and the first time we had formed an India country and similar freedom movements were happening all around the world and we didn't want to interfere in that context. We wanted each person to be a South African to be a South African, a Nigerian to be a Nigerian, a, a Fijian to be a Fijian or whatever else and, and be part of their own national movements or whatever else was happening in those countries. So that was a particular kind of activity but everything changed when? If you really ask yourself, it changes in 1991. And why does it change in 1991? Because suddenly we have a liberal market economy. And in a liberal market economy, we encourage both mobility, but we also encourage investment. And so suddenly we have a different format under which the country is functioning. And therefore we encourage investment. And investment doesn't have to be only capital in nature. Investment is also intellectual and technology. It's all about being able to connect in that context. And that is why we see post-91 a sea change. And then you're all aware that a new ministry called Overseas Indian Affairs gets formed in 2004, etc., etc., etc. And basically, today, the Indian diaspora is considered as a tremendous resource. Now, there are various ways that it works. And Madam was correctly pointing out that it begins with being religious and social activities and then it slowly rises up the chain. I've done a recent book, incidentally, we're all plugging our books here, was one, let me plug my book. I read a book last year, last month, which was released again by Rutledge. It's called The Politics of Migration. I did this with Professor Hirdhya Rajan, who will speak here on the third day or second day or whatever uh, in this conference. What did we look at? We looked at the, a different context of migration. We looked at the politics of migration. Migration has always been seen as an economic activity, the mobility of desire for people for a better life, etc., etc. But if you look at the politics of it, there are two politics that actually play in it. Political one is domestic policies. Domestic policies sometimes compel people to think of going overseas. And when they start sending remittances back, it has an impact. Devesh Kapoor has done this whole work on Kerala, which shows just that, that maybe a lot of development work didn't happen in Kerala because enough money was coming back. As you know, 
the state domestic product of uh, 37 percent of the state domestic product of Kerala is remittances. I mean, what does what does government need to do? It's, it's all happening in any case. So this this is a compulsive. There's something behind that. Punjab, you know that Punjab politicians go to Canada to canvass. So there must be some connectivity there. So there is a politics domestically. Internationally, there's a very strong politics of migration. You as a community overseas, and India has very large communities in some 130 countries overseas. It, it is Indian migrants are present in 194 or whatever the UN records as countries, but we are significant in over 100 of them. What does this mean? That if you're going to have a place in that society, you need to go up in steps and in chains. You'll begin at social activity, education, what have you. You'll get into health, you'll get into professionals, then you'll begin to form your own community, whatever Indian organizations, and then finally you'll get into politics. And this is what I've traced in that book and I talk of Canada and the US and UK and whatever else. So this this movement by which the diaspora begins to realize that unless they want to, unless they get into politics, they're not going to be able to be economically sustainable in that new environment. And that they in doing that, they also connect with, with the Indian or homeland or what have you. But remember which diaspora connects with homeland? The one that sees an economic benefit in it. So the success story of India is reflected in the connectivity of the Indian diaspora with India. That's why I talked of 91 and the changes that came about after that. So this is a dual play which, which happens and, and I'm, I, I won't go into any more details of this. There's lots of more stuff on it but we and FIKI, the, uh, the part of being a business organization, have established something called, uh, we call it GATES. It's a global alliance for talent, entrepreneurship and skills. What we are trying to do is we are trying to connect other business organizations with us around the world to say that unless you make the business case for migration, you're not going to be able to have talent, entrepreneurship and skills. So bring that all together, come on the safe platform and, and, and push the agenda. And thank you very much for inviting me here today and thank you for this excellent uh, migration and development conference that you're having. I see really superb uh, persons that are, that are researchers and, and professors and what have you during these next two days and you're going to have excellent uh, discussions what have you but remember that unless we make this case again and again and again and make it internationally migration and diaspora will not become development thank you thank you sir for your stimulating words on the conference theme